the urge to ask everybody whether you think a hotshot pilot or a cow inseminator has more red flags is strong, but I think I'll leave that up to the audience. Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to-be-read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Kareen from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning, this podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Keep It Fictional. I'm Gabriel, and I'm here with my book friends. We have Kareen, Virginia, Mark, and Fiona. And September is here. And September is Latine or Latinx Heritage Month. And of course, here at the Port Moody Library, we like to read authors from all over the world every month. But this week, we wanted to take ourselves on a tour of Latin America, South America, and the diaspora. So unless my book friends have changed their picks, I believe we have authors from Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, among others. So we picked a variety. We tried not to have too many from the same place. So I am going to pass it over to Virginia for our first book. Where are we going, Virginia? All right, we're going to go first to Argentina. Um, so I am super, super excited to have the opportunity to tell you about my book today. It is a nominee for the 2022 International Booker Prize. And it is also probably one of the best one that I read recently. I've started doing more books by Latin American authors and have discovered so many wonderful works. But um, this one is just so, so, so good. It is Elena Knows by Claudia Pinheiro, and is translated by Francis Riddle. Elena has her whole day planned out. When she needs to leave the house, which five blocks she needs to walk across to get to the train station and how long it will take her. When she needs to get on the train, 10 o'clock, nothing else would do. How long that trip is going to take, which stops she needs to get off at. And afterwards... Uh, things get a little hazy, but she needs to find a house and she has the directions. She know what kind of front door looks like, but she doesn't have an address, but it's okay. She just first needs to get on that train. Today, she's going to go visit Isabel, who lives across town. And she f- needs to follow this exact schedule because she took the pill at nine o'clock. When the pill takes effect, She only has a limited window of time when she has control over her body. She, not that bloody illness of hers, can tell her arms and her legs what to do. And she is going to go across town to pay a visit to Isabel today to call in a debt. A few months ago, the police came to Elena. They said that they found her daughter Rita's body hung from the church's bell tower. They didn't think anything was suspicious. To them, it was a very clear case. But Elena knows that it can't be true, that her daughter cannot have killed herself that day. It's not because she doesn't want to accept that her daughter is dead, but that she knows her daughter is deeply terrified of lightning. And the day that they claim she died, it was raining really, really hard. And there is no way that her daughter Rita will go out, let alone going near one of the taller buildings in town. There is more to her daughter's death, and she is going to find out. But the bloody illness has taken over her body, and she needs someone else to lend her their body so that she can go investigate, so that she can go find out what happened to her daughter, so that she can find out the truth. And that is why today, Elena is going to play her last card. She's going to try to find who killed her daughter and to talk to the only person in the world who can help her because of this long ago debt. But first, Elena has to lift up her right foot, just a few centimeters off the floor, move it forward through the air, just enough to get past the left foot. And when it gets as far as it can go, lower it. 
Claudia Pinheiro is known as the queen of crime in Argentina. She's known as the hitchhawk of the River Plate. From this book, you can tell her skills as a crime writer, how she builds up the suspense, how she weaves the story elements all so tightly together, everything leading to a really satisfying ending. She knows mystery. She knows how to write. It's very, very clear. So I'm very much looking forward to reading other books by her. That is more in that genre. But Elena knows this book is not quite a mystery. It initially caught my eye because for me, there is nothing that scares me more, especially now that I'm getting older, about losing control over your mind, about not recognizing people, not remembering things. That scares me a lot. And so I tend to read a lot of books about this topic. And through this novel that is set during this one single day, as we follow Elena across town, Pinheiro let us experience this one day in the life of someone living with a debilitating illness. As we walk with her, with her bowed head, her shuffling feet, that she's forced down, that she's constantly just looking at people's legs and feet and lap because she can't lift her head because she doesn't have control over her body. We feel and we see the world through her eyes, through that same point of view of all the pressure on you when you are sick. We see all the roadblocks that the world has set up for you, that the society has spent so little effort in taking care of the sick, in taking care of the elderly, in taking care of people with disabilities, that they don't care. And it's not set up for someone like Elena. And that how hard it is and how devastating it is to watch her try to make a trip and going through something that we take for granted. Elena knows it's also a book that really look at a mother-daughter relationship. And in this case, a really volatile one. Some of the exchanges between the two, um, because this book is so honest and it's so unflinching, it's just, it's really hard to read. For example, watching them sometimes when they argue, Rita will purposely hasten her steps so that she can keep a distance, knowing that her mother can't keep up. Or that the exchange about how Rita wants Elena to go to the salon to get a haircut. And Elena is like, I don't care how I look. I'm 63. Like, this doesn't matter to me. And Rita is like, no, it's not you. You don't have to look at yourself. I have to look at you every single day, mom. And you look disgusting. And you can tell that all these seemingly very mean kind of comments, they're all here because of how hard it is to be a caregiver in Rita's case and, and all the stress that she has and that there's nothing to relieve her of that and the bureaucracy that she has to deal with every single time when she needs to get help for her mother. There is no help and it's draining her. It's one of those books that is hard to read, but yet it is so, it's so important. It's so, so heart-wrenching. But on top of that, there's another layer to this story, um, another really important and, and sadly really timely topic that the author tackles. And I'm not going to spoil it because it's not in the blurb and, and I didn't know that going in and I had a really, really like a, just a very tremendous reading experience and so thought provoking. And I, I'm not going to ruin it for you, but if you do want to look up sort of content of the book, because there might be certain topics that you don't want to read about, then I would suggest looking up Pinheiro's life as an activist and through her work, you you can tell what topic she will tackle in this book. It provides such a good parallel to Elena's story. It's just, it's a perfect book in my mind. And last but not least, I just want to give a shout out to the publisher, Chaco Press, that introduced me to this book. It's a publisher that has made it a mission to bring more contemporary Latin American literature to, into English. Um, so I'm really, really excited um, that I've discovered them, really thankful for the work that they do. And I'm looking forward to reading more from their back catalog and also from the future catalog. So again, I can't recommend this book enough. It is excellent. This is Elena Knows by Claudia Pinheiro. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Virginia. So intense as we generally expect a Virginia book to be, but and I almost kind of feel like a different kind of intense. Like it's it's a little bit, um, yeah, like less space, locked room mystery and a little bit more, I guess, some of the fears that we might actually have come to light. A little bit less Lovecraftian, I guess. Um <laughs> to use a fellow who's maybe not that great, but all right. 
I am going to go from Virginia and we're going to see where Kareen wants to take us. Ah, well, Kareen is taking us to the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico in the late 19th century. And this is a book inspired by another book, which I love. I love a good, like, literary heritage, a lineage. But I picked it up because I really enjoyed the author's work, but also because... The movie based on the book that this book is based on was the first movie that I watched where I realized that movies could be bad, like really, really bad. So this book is based on the H.G. Wells 1896 classic, The Island of Dr. Monroe. And in 1996, something truly special was made. And that is the disastrous adaptation of this book. Some of the things that happened is that the director was fired via fax. Marlon Brando, who was the lead, refused to learn any of his lines and so had a little radio in his ear. Um, So sometimes that would kind of get cross current and he would just, in the middle of his big speech about, what is man? Are we not a beast? Robbery on Woodward. Because they, he couldn't decide what was the police scanner and what were his lines being fed to him. At some point, Val Kilmer just refused to be on set for two days and was served his divorce papers on set from his wife of seven years. And Rob Moreau had a, a heartfelt telephone call with New Line executives where he essentially pleaded with them on bended knee while, like, crying profusely for them to fire him from this movie. (laughs) Which they did. So, if you really do want to enjoy just a train wreck of a film, you should absolutely check out the Val Kilmer, Marlon Brando, uh, David Thelwis adaptation of this book. But if you want something a little bit more literary... You could pick up Silvio Moreno Garcia's new book, The Daughter of Dr. Moreau. Silvio Moreno Garcia is a Mexican Canadian author who actually lives in Vancouver and is probably best known for her, I would argue, best book, which is Mexican Gothic. Although Virginia would probably fight me about that, and that's fine. I would probably win. I'm very scrappy. But this is her brand new book that just came out this year. And of course, it is taking inspiration from this classic work, which was all about how animal vivisection is wrong. No disagreements there. But the kind of like spreading about Darwinian evolution and the degeneration of the human race, which surprise, surprise, is racist. But this book tackles some different themes. So it is 1871. Again, we are on the Yucatan Peninsula and Dr. Monroe, and I'm going to say Monroe many times, but I mean Moreau. It's just not going to happen. So Dr. Moreau and his young daughter Carlotta are waiting for the arrival of their patron, Mr. Lizardale. Oh, it's kind of like lizard. Oh, I see what she did there. The real animals are the humans. (laughs) <laughs> and their new major domo. So they're kind of like butler, jack of all trades, who will oversee their hacienda. Carlotta has always been isolated. She has never left the confines of their home. They live in the middle of a jungle surrounded by danger of all sides. However, she has never felt that isolation. She has never felt that loneliness because she is surrounded by her friends, Uh, Lupe and Cachito, who are kind of her own age, and they get into a lot of scrapes together. Um, Ramona, the housekeeper, who is kind and full of wisdom and teaches Carlotta all about plants. And of course, the godlike figure of her father, who Carlotta believes is a genius. Um, He has taught her Latin. He teaches her about science. He kind of lets her into his great works, his revolutionary science that he is undertaking. With Mr. Lizard, Mr. Lizard is what we're going to call him from now on. Uh, With Mr. Lizard, he is bringing the new major domo, who is Montgomery, who is our other point of view character, who is an Englishman who has kind of found himself in different parts of the world, escaping from his troubled youth and a really bad marriage that, quite honestly, anyone could have seen was a terrible idea. 
don't marry a woman who loves jewels if you got no money. Anyways, he's sad. They bring him to show him around the estate in the hopes of kind of luring him for a job. And really, Montgomery has no choice because his debts have all been sold to Mr. Lizard, and he is going to take this job whether he wants it or not. And he really doesn't want it. When he arrives on the island, Dr. Moreau and Carlotta show him to the lab where the great works of Dr. Moreau are shown. While Carlotta, his daughter, thinks that her father is a genius, Montgomery thinks that he is a madman. What he is doing is... <laughs> Boy. Okay. He's taking gemules from humans and putting them into animals so that they're kind of humanimals. <laughs> So you take a little bit of human and you shove it into a jaguar and then you get like a furry human. <laughs> get a furry. <laughs> get a furry. Um, however, because this is Sylvia Moreno Garcia, it is not just an experiment. Well, it is kind of just an experiment in weirdness, but it is also because Mr. Lizard wishes to recruit a workforce that are wholly and solely dependent on him. So this is set in the backdrop of real historical struggle between um, the Mayans and the Mexican government and various uh, rebel factions that are working in the area. So it's, it's rooted in real historical events and it is drawing on some things to make some points. Yeah. So Montgomery reluctantly agrees. And from there, they live a fairly peaceful life, making their animal, their their animorphs, or as I can see in the chat, bee stars, maminals. <laughs> Again, they don't have any cool nicknames in the book. They're just called hybrids. What a lost opportunity. Um, everything is going well. Carlotta grows up and she's a she's a babe, and everything is cool until two hot men strangers show up. And then everything starts going bad. So, um, this book is trying to do a lot. And I don't know that it necessarily succeeds in doing everything that the author wants to do. It's trying to be like a very feminist retelling of this. It's trying to be a more accurate historical representation of the place and the time. And it is also attempting to be a love story, question mark, question mark, between some people that arguably shouldn't. I, I don't think that it really achieves what the author wanted to in the same way that I really think Mexican Gothic did. I think that this is a very ambitious book. Um, I think that it is wrestling with a lot of very interesting questions that are brought up from the original text that are trying to be brought into a modern light. But yeah, ultimately, it, it goes down very smooth. It's a very fast read. If you are obsessed with the 1996 film, this will definitely have to be read. But if you are looking for maybe what I would, and sorry, Virginia, consider like the strongest work by this particular author, I would definitely say Mexican Gothic. I know Virginia would say Gods of Jade and Shadow. That's fine. But it is, oh, it's got a great cover got a great cover and is ultimately i i love a good modern remix of an old classic story so if any of that appeals to you or if you just want to think of even more interesting ways to kind of combine human and animal and just spend a book thinking about that like why would you make a shark person with so many teeth so many teeth oh yeah it's also about like Animal cruelty, question mark? Hmm. Anyways, um, if any of that really appeals to you, you should definitely check out The Daughter of Dr. Moreau. Or Monroe. Depends how you say it. All right. <laughs> there was a lot there. Do the sharks have dentist trips? Well, see, that's the problem, is that Dr. Moreau refuses to do any dentistry, so Carlotta has to do dentistry. But, like, if you're going to create a shark person, should you not have a plan? Because their teeth are constantly coming in and coming back out. He didn't really think this through. Like, sure, you can make a hybrid or an uh, anamorph, but, like, have you, who's going to take care of it? Who's going to, like, feed it? Who's going to take it for walks? You think, though? That might have been, like, a retirement plan, because you could make bank on the tooth fairy if you were a shark hybrid. 
so this might have been like a a little bit of a like looking down the future five year plan animal cruelty message but also in this day and age in this particular historical period maybe the tooth fairy is given a little more than we get these days so maybe we have to consider that <laughs> so to give us <laughs> maybe a little bit of a palate cleanser from <laughs> kareen's <laughs> kareen's interesting pick that does a lot of stuff that could be interesting to read just based on the fact that it does a lot of stuff um i'm going to ask my book friends if you could travel to any country that would be south of the united states so in latin america or south america where would you want to go and if you want to answer why i guess the answer i probably would give be brazil simply because I know a lot of people in Canada who are from Brazil or who were in Canada briefly who have gone back to Brazil. So just knowing what I've heard from them about parts of the country or being able to see some of those people again, I think Brazil probably would be one of my first choices, if not the very first choice. Would you T-pose beside the like the statue in Rio? No. no. <laughs> I, I cannot be doing that. I just, <laughs> it's too tacky tourist for me. Mark, would you go to like Pisa and not do the like, oh, I'm holding up the tech? Come on. Then what's the point? Then what's the point? Um, I'm going to say Peru because I really would like to see Machu Picchu. And I know it's like very touristic and it's probably like not what I think it is, but I think it's just it's incredible. Every picture or documentary that I've seen from it kind of like actually takes my breath away. And I think it actually would take my breath away because I do not have enough iron in my blood. I'm pretty sure it would kill me to be up that high. But I, at, at some point in my like life, I would really, really, really love to 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 see it with my own eyeballs. And I would like to take a, a very cheesy tourist picture with me and a llama slash alpaca. Can't tell the difference. That's so totally different. Alpaca is so much better. Anyway, Oh, feel that free. Ah, yay. I agree 100%. So much softer, way less uh, teeth. And the hair, the hair, the hairstyle is amazing for an alpaca. Like llama can't do it. Anyway, um, I oh Fiona's favorite answer. Uh, I don't travel, um, so I would not go anywhere. Um, but but if I have to pick, it would be based on like which football team that I do not like. So I would never go to Brazil because I hated them. I will also never go to Argentina because I also hated their football team when I was young, when I was watching soccer. So uh, I think Chile, I'm going to pick Chile just because my first introduction to Latin American literature is from Chile. So that would be where I would go just for that. Okay. I'm going to talk a lot and not answer the question. So um, I, I have a desire to go to Cuba. Uh, but also the only place south of the U.S. that I've been is um, Belize, and I am dying to go back to Belize. But really, I will go anywhere and would love to go anywhere. And I have this idea to do like a chocolate and and coffee tour because those are the best things on Earth and the very best of them are grown in South America. So I just want to like just go to all the the great plantations and and see how cocoa is actually like grown and drink all the coffee. All right. Some interesting answers. Definitely. I can't believe we don't have a messy fan here. Literally the only person I know. <laughs> um, I, unfortunately, I think, so Kareen more or less took the pick that I would, that I have. I'm definitely someone who would also really like to see Machu Picchu. And so if anybody hasn't read it, really, really great book is Che Guevara's My Motorcycle Diaries, which is a sort of his awakening as an activist and sort of how he forms his political thought. But it's it's taken on the back of a motorcycle as he does a road trip across Latin America. And so he spends a lot of time intimately in these different places. They're, they head up to um, actually a leper colony because he was studying leprosy. He was a, a med student and it's a very interesting book. But the way that he talks about Peru and Lima and Cusco in particular um, and the way he describes the city built on top of itself and the different sort of like eons of how the city changed and how it looks. I I think it would be really amazing to go there and really amazing to to kind of see that. So I definitely also a Peru person. I love the mountains as well. I think it'd be really cool. And if I couldn't go to Peru because Kareen has somehow taken up all of the real estate there somehow, uh, I think I would go to Venezuela because I think that is where most of my extended family is right now. 
I don't think anybody's still in Brazil. So I would want to go to Venezuela just based on the fact that there might be a couch I could crash on. And then <laughs> I, I could meet some people. I could see some of the surrounding stuff because I know it's not a touristy area that, that we're from, but that's okay. I think it'd be kind of cool to go there. So, all right. We have we have some different different places that we might like to go to. And I am going to take us now with my book back to America and back to the diaspora. So I chose a Chicano book and a short story collection. So this is Gordo by Jaime Cortez, and it is his debut short story collection. It's set in and around the Pajaro Valley and Watsonville, California. So Cortez is an artist and an author, and his portfolio uh, like features a few different art forms, including comics and more traditional art. And so the stories in the book are semi-autobiographical, as he's also based around Watsonville, and he kind of either shared these experiences or observed them growing up. So it's not meant to be a direct representation of his life, but it's definitely one that strikes close to home for him. So the stories in the collection do feature a few different main characters, including El Gordo, the character from the title. The whole book, it's a, a very specific image of what it means to be Chicano and working class in the 1970s, which, if you know anything about American history, that was a particular period for a lot of um, Chicano movements and some of the different political thought that came from there. There's actually a website online that lets you listen to what the radio would have been like in a specific country during a specific decade. And I highly recommend sending it to 1970s Mexico while reading this book. It's called Radio, and it's just like a lot of O's on the end of it. I usually just sort of hold the, the button down, and then I search, and then it knows what I want. Um, so I don't know how many O's it actually has. Uh, so who is Gordo? Well, to start, he is someone who spent part of his childhood in a migrant workers camp just outside the city. He's not an overly masculine kid, and he's not that interested in sports. In fact, he's a, a bit overweight, which is how he got the nickname Gordo. His father wants to fix that, and he hopes he can do it with Lucha Libre, which is a form of wrestling. So when his papa gets him an outfit inspired by his favorite luchador, Gordo is overjoyed about the pretty boots. So even if Gordo doesn't really want to be a fighter, he's he's willing to give it a shot. Maybe this is the thing that's going to make his papa proud of him or make him start fitting in with the other kids. But it, unfortunately, a play fight in the workers' camp ends with another child getting quite hurt. So when the family moves out of the workers' camp and into Watsonville proper, Gordo continues to grow up. He continues to change his idea of how the world works and he meets alex his neighbor who he initially assumes is a man his sister thinks alex is a weirdo but gordo kind of relates to this butch lesbian because they're both outsiders and they go through a lot of pain because of it but unfortunately uh, delia who's alex's girlfriend is actually being abused by her and gordo's family discovers this so even with the element of sort of sameness. There's also this sort of very startling realization. And uh, there's, in general, a lot of very serious topics that are covered in these short stories. But the interesting thing is that Gordo's narrative voice actually has this element of childlike wonder and innocence, even in the way that he sort of learns lessons and he interprets what's going on, that it, it matches, but also is kind of almost oxymoronic to the world that he's living in sometimes. And so it's an interesting dynamic to see come up. As I mentioned, there's a very fierce element of Chicano pride. Uh, you have characters like Fat Cookie, who is an amateur graffiti artist writing pro-Chicano slogans on the walls of the camp and hosting dance competitions for the kids. There's also Benito and Manuel, also known as Los Tigres, who are identical teen brothers that arrive without a family at the workers' camp for the harvest, and then they leave again. Um, their story that is in here actually involves um, an injury in a drunken brawl and the uh, visit to the emergency room after, which is obviously a big deal when you are Indigenous and also when you're American because of 
how healthcare is. At the party before the brawl, Gordo is there as well. Um, he's encouraged to drink, even though he's not necessarily that interested in it. But he's sort of rejoicing in the fact that he's finally being accepted by the men around him in this culture of fighting and drinking and and all of the things that kind of come with that. Sexuality is also something that's explored in some of the other stories, uh, in particular with Raimundo, who faces homophobia because of his long hair. But he's also a well-sought-after hairdresser, so he's kind of harassed by the men while catering to their girlfriends. He's eventually asked to make a wig look good for one of his high school bullies for the open casket funeral. Ultimately, Ray is, I'd say he's one of the stories that's sort of interesting, almost in contrast to Gordo, the way that they think is very different, the way they act, and how Ray decides to react to peer pressure when he faces it versus sort of Gordo's um, want to, to fit in with the society that he's a part of. Other characters also kind of explore like Americanism and that idea of who belongs, uh, particularly along the lines, of course, of documented and undocumented immigrants and how those folks are treated badly, even in workers camps. Violence is really, I think, a main feature of a lot of the stories. But it's interesting because Cortez doesn't look ex like directly at it and it doesn't take over the stories, even though it's kind of accepted as part of the background of a lot of them. And as I mentioned before, he's very good at writing as a child, even when Gordo is growing up. And there's, yeah, there's this understanding that it's a violent world, but there's also hope and resilience and humor alongside it. And it's the sort of story that, that can make you cry. And honestly, not because of how bad it is, but how sort of relatable it is, I think, in this world, even across, even across culture, even if like living in a worker camp isn't something that you've ever sort of experienced or know that much about. It's also about like the resilience of culture. And as with a lot of stories like this, that unraveling of generational trauma and in general, like cultural survival. And so I think it's, it's kind of an, it's an interesting one. I would say Gordo by Jaime Cortez is one that's worth picking up. Even if you only end up reading like a few of the different stories, I think some of them are quite good. And, uh, Especially if you're interested in one of the narrators that I talked about, I don't think you'd necessarily have to read the others just to read the story that's about them. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to... We'll go to Mark. So for my book today, I'll be talking about uh, Reputations by Juan Gabriel Vasquez. He is a Colombian writer. Uh, he was born in Bogota. But he began his literary career in Paris in 1996 after he completed a degree in law in Colombia. He emigrated to Paris and sort of made a somewhat unusual transition from law to literature. I'm not entirely sure what prompted him to make that change, but definitely was, wasn't his original plan to be an author, it seems like. He's produced novels, short stories, and nonfiction works on literature and various political commentary. And his novels have garnered a few different literary awards, including the Alfa Guara Novel Prize for Best Novel in Spanish and the International Dublin Literary Award for an English Translation of a Novel. And in this particular work, we follow Javier Malarino, who is a famous cartoonist. He has a daily political themed cartoon that's appeared in the daily newspaper for the past four decades. And in the present day, he's been honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award and commemorative stamp series from his country, even though Malarino views it as being a country that has no respect for art, truth, or human decency of any kind, really. In preparation for receiving these honors, he reflects on the previous four decades of his life, including his ex-wife Magdalena, their daughter Beatriz, who he's estranged from, his early development as a painter, who eventually became a cartoonist, and his frequent brushings with his editors, government censors, and spats with family and friends over the content of his illustrations. This reflection sort of reveals that Malarino's sort of youth, he was kind of like a self-assured confidence in himself and his abilities and his kind of worldview. But as time has gone on, he's sort of become much more uh, reflective. He's become uh, more humbled due to his divorce, being estranged from his daughter, and sort of increasingly becoming weary from his own success and sort of seeing like how it even though he's personally gained success, what has his impact actually been on the country? Has the 
country managed to politically mature. It hasn't become more conflict free. It's sort of just sort of been something that has crewed his own kind of prominent reputation without really having any larger impact on anything outside of his own kind of self-respect from the general public. Following the hullabaloo of the honors, Malarino grants an interview with an unknown young woman whose only credentials appear to be an online blog. Against his sort of like usual reticence to do interviews, Malarino decides to accept the interview and it invites the woman to come to his house for an interview. Uh, when she arrives at his home and begins the interview, she reveals that she is in fact distantly acquainted with Malarino and she was actually uh, briefly a friend of his daughter and that her name is uh, Samantha Leal. It's here that Malarino is sort of taken back in his memories to the day of a party he held when he first moved into his home 28 years earlier. As it turns out, the night of the housewarming party, after separating from Magdalena, Beatrice had invited a friend of hers at the time, which, of course, is this now woman, Samantha Leal. It is during this party that an unwanted guest appeared, named Adolfo Quelar, a bombastic right-wing congressman who has been displeased by the cartoons that Malarino has drawn of him of late. This congressman was invited by a friend from his newspaper without Malarino's knowledge, because this politician wants to speak with him about certain things. And against his expectations of like a kind of angry brow beating, Quaylar instead goes with a little pleading kind of a have mercy on me little speech to implore him to think of how his family, his friends, and the general public will see him. This important congressman is being mocked in the daily papers to sort of take pity on him. It's amiss this kind of sorry scene that Malarino is interrupted by a party guest imploring him to come check on the girls who have passed out. So as it turns out, they have been drinking discarded drinks left by the party guests in a kind of lack of parental oversight and general adult responsibility this has happened sort of in his own home uh leaving the party to tend to the girls until they appear to be okay uh Malarino temporarily leaves them to welcome in Samantha's father who has come to pick her up and take her home when returning to the girls they find Quaylar walking past them from the room that the girls were in and find Samantha in the bed in a rather suggestive position we shall say so, so this sort of leads Samantha's father to fly into a fit of rage, attempting to apprehend Quaylar amidst a flurry of accusations and trying to grasp him before he's able to flee the home. And it's from here that the second half of the novel kind of revolves around uh, Malarino's response to these events, the days and years that followed regarding the fallout of what happened, of his response through his own sort of political cartoons and his own um, involvement publicly in terms of accusations that were then made against Quaylar and the kind of aftermath that comes up from this. The book itself kind of revolves around this idea of, and not surprisingly, since the book is called Reputations, how people are perceived publicly, how their actions are perceived differently by different kinds of people, how different kinds of positions grant you the ability to um, be believed, to make portrayals of other people in certain ways that are more or less believed or disbelieved. And Malarina at one point kind of refers to reputation itself as kind of a, a fabricated presence that precedes you, that isn't really you itself. It's just how people think of you. And that kind of is like the central theme of the novel itself, how different people in different positions may be viewed differently depending on their current standing or if in these kinds of public conflicts, who is trusted, who is not trusted, and things like that. The book itself also has a lot of psychological insight into Malarino as a character. The vast majority of the book is his own kind of inner uh, reflection and dialogue. There is like some conversations between himself with characters like Samantha and his ex-wife. But for the most part, it's, it's, his own, it's his own reflections, his own recollection of different events. It's definitely very much focused on him and his own perception. So if you like a novel that focuses very much on a kind of character study of this one particular person, this one kind of situation, in his kind of profession, then you may find that interesting. But if you're a fan of more, like, let's say, uh, outward facing kind of a, a narrative where it's focused on a wider variety of characters, you may not like it quite as much. But I personally do kind of like these kinds of introspective kind of psychological insight to characters. So if you like that kind of story, that's kind of protagonist or a narrative that spans many different decades, or like a political kind of uh, narrative, then you may also like. Reputations by Juan Gabriel Vasquez. Interesting. Yeah, we got some political drama. And as always, a very, very character-based kind of book, which is sort of 
just sort of interesting. Um, maybe it's one that you know, J.K. Rowling <laughs> might have had a look at when she's writing about her own reputation. <laughs> Isn't that something that's supposed to be in the new book? How people, how quickly reputations can turn on you. Among other things. <laughs> anyway. All right. Thank you, Mark, for an interesting, an interesting read. All right. And I think we have Fiona next. Yes. Um, I picked up Isabel Allende's 21st book in her most recent novel. She is a Chilean author who has some books that are considered part of the modern canon of Latinx books. So um, I have not read of any of her other books, but I, I did know about her reputation. And it definitely, her other books came up a lot when I was doing research for this. So uh, I think I was initially drawn in by the cover. It is uh, Violetta. And it definitely is very much a me book. Uh, it is technically an epistolary novel, and it spans 100 years and is very much a family drama. However, um, like Mark's uh, book, it is very much from a single perspective. We, we see everything through the filter of, of the teller, through Violetta. So although we're seeing it through uh, Violetta's perspective, uh, we do have many characters to learn about and, and love and hate um, and try to remember their names. And for me, that's very much I love. I love long spanning novels and I do love a family drama. Um, so the book starts out with uh, the birth of Violetta in 1920 during the pandemic. She is the sixth child and is preceded by five brothers. So her family is very excited when she is born. She's born into a conservative, wealthy family. She's an obstinate child and is spoiled until one day they bring in an English governess, Miss Taylor, who kind of defies their expectation about uh, what what a an upright English woman might be. Uh, she's She's young and she's more progressive than they imagined, and she ends up kind of being adopted into the family. Miss Taylor introduces Violetta to many new ideas uh, and herself meets a woman who considers herself to be a feminist and is is fighting for women's suffrage. And uh, Miss Taylor actually falls in love with her and they have a long standing romance uh, where they they fight the patriarchy together. Uh, so I really enjoyed that kind of little aspect. But because of the the it being her life, it's like it's almost this like fictional autobiography. We we sweep by things quickly. A uh, hundred years is a lot to tell in in four hundred pages. So we get these sort of little vignettes of characters. And Miss um, Taylor and her and her lover Teresa was was one of my favorites. We also learn about Violetta's brother, who has to take over the family's business and reputation when their father completely ruins their reputation and loses their fortune and they are moved into sort of the boonies and there one of her other brothers who was considered to be slow and stupid in the city finds himself in nature and has this opportunity to build community she also meets uh, a couple who have a traveling school, which I really loved. Um, so in order to reach all of these sort of farm children all over um, this this rural area, they have a traveling classroom and Violetta gets recruited to go along with them and do a little bit of teaching all over the countryside. Again, this is only, you know, this is sort of the first like 15 years of her 100 year life. She meets uh, the man that she'll marry who just kind of decides that she's the one for him, but he's really uh, very boring. Fabian is a, is a vet uh, and he's obsessed with inseminating cows <laughs> and that is his passion. And she's like, you know, he's so, he's so steady and like, you know, I know I can rely on him, but oh, he's so boring. All he ever talks about is like inseminating cows. Uh, so like, fair enough. Uh, and then she is soon swept off her feet by the Playboy pilot. And that is when her life really takes a turn. And we take a turn from her from her um, immediate family and sort of found family in the country to her adult life, which is a little bit more rocky. <laughs> so it's a really interesting history of Chile. We have or and also, you know, other Latinx countries. We we get a lot of the political 
history and flavor, but because it's all seen through this sort of like wealthy, conservative woman's eyes, it's very come and go. You know, there are times in her life where she becomes engaged with politics and and is paying attention and other time where she sort of just gets focused on her personal life and she has that privilege to just walk away from from all of the um, the things that are uh that are happening in her country, as well as other countries where her um, her hotshot pilot ferries fugitives from place to place, some some Cuban diplomats, and to him it's a paycheck. It doesn't matter whether which side they're on. So I really liked the way it was bookended. Um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. There was the pandemic in the 1920s, and then we are currently having our pandemic in the 1920s, and her that is how her life is uh, is sort of book ended. Um, the letter itself, which is the entire book, is uh, written to someone named Camilo, uh, whose relationship we we find out a little bit later in the book. And yeah, for me, it was a really like, like a comfort read that gave me a lot to think about, which is really like, I, you know, probably won't make my top 10 books, but it's that really solid, like uh, an enjoyment of every time I pick up this book. So Certainly, if you lean towards family narratives, family dramas, and you love that that time span of just seeing how things can change, it was a really um, interesting reflection on on the past century told through this woman's point of view. So that is Violetta with this beautiful flowery cover by Isabel Allende, very much based on aspects of her own life. And again, I also enjoyed going through and, and pulling out uh, from her biography as well and seeing those side to side what what uh, was inspired by what. All right. Okay. The urge to ask everybody whether you think a hotshot pilot or a cow inseminator has more red flags is strong, but I think I'll leave that up to the audience. Um, think about it amongst yourselves. If you see one of us in the library, maybe let us know your opinions on it. So... Thank you for joining us for our Latina Heritage Month podcast episode. Of course, we hope that you read books from the Latin diaspora all throughout the year, but it's always good to have a time to talk about them in particular. So we hope that you have found at least one or two that sound interesting to you and that you have a great week. We'll see you. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional. Mm-hmm.